Okay, um, folks, uh, we are going to get started in just a minute. If you have any audio problems or anything like that, if you can hear us okay, just let us know in the chat or the Q&A. Um, okay, and we are... We are going to get started right now. I'm here with Peter Cheer. Today's topic is, is there a bond bubble? So we're going to be talking all things fixed income. That's corporates, treasuries. We're going to talk some Bernanke, a broader economy, um, currency wars, money printing, all that stuff. Now, um, if you don't know Peter Cheer, Peter is the founder of TF Market Advisors. He authors Minneville's Fixed Income Report. And... Um, he is he is our premier guy on fixed income. He's always being quoted by the Journal, Financial Times, Bloomberg, when they want to know about LTRO, London Whale Trade, um, any of the ECBs, Alphabet Soup, uh, Treasuries, they go to Peter because, frankly, um, you know, in my opinion, there's nobody better. Okay, so we are going to move on um, to what is a bubble. So, Peter, why don't you tell us about um, your definition of a bubble? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we obviously, everyone's talking about our bonds in a bubble. Um, Funny enough, the consensus seems to be they are. I don't agree with them. Before we get in, even into that, it's, you know, I do not like the Fed's policy. I think the Fed's policy is wrong. But having said that, I think understanding what the Fed policy is, what it means, and how it's going to impact the markets is crucial. And I think a lot of people have misunderstood how it's going to work in bonds. So anyways, you know, if we take a working definition of a 20% you know, retracement as a, in a fairly short period of time as a bubble or a bear market, you know, that's probably a fairly good one to work with. I think we want to narrow this definition right now to at least start with the 10-year treasury. I think you know, when we talk about fixed income markets or credit, you know, there's high yield, there's EM, there's short data T-bills, there's TLT, there's the long bond. Um, so let's kind of, we'll keep this focus primarily to the 10-year so we can use that as a benchmark and from there we can move around. Um, and then not only do I not think there's a bubble, from time to time, I actually think there's good opportunities to invest in bonds. We're not always long. Our recommendations aren't always long. We had had a target of 180 on the 10-year fairly recently. We actually changed that and tightened it up to 160. Normally, we would have been out. We think things have gone on that take us to that 160 on the 10-year, and we'll walk through that. But, you know, so hopefully, while we're explaining, not only is it not a bubble, here's why the Treasury market can offer value. Um, okay. Um, now, that is a pretty bold statement because um, we talked about this a little bit offline, but... Um, feels like conventional wisdom is that there is a bubble, especially among equity investors. Now, um, do you believe, in the, a lot of people say, the bond market is smarter than the equity markets. I mean, do you believe that? And are Treasury saying anything now that equities aren't? You know, I think there's two differences. One is, I would say, the bond market as a whole thinks much more about the downside than equity side does. So I think, you know, as a bond investor, all you're going to get at best case is your coupon and your principal back. So you start with actually a fairly defensive view. So I would say that is one difference. And the bond market's actually thought about this. We're not being stupid. We've thought about this from a lot of reasons um, and defensive reasons. So I think, yeah, we are defensive, and I wouldn't say smarter, but we worry more about the downside, and yet the decisions made for things to be here. The other thing I think that people forget is the fixed income or credit markets, it's really, to some extent, almost mathematical, but there are certain trades that work. If someone's going to lend you money at zero, you try and lend money slightly higher. So I think how we look at the market is different. I think equity comes in. Um, and the biggest why I think equity guys are making right now is misunderstanding exactly how the policy is working, but also more importantly, somehow people have believed in this great rotation trade, which I don't think is necessary either. There's no reason that equities can't go up while treasuries do reasonably well as well. So I think those are kind of the issues to take a look at and think about as we go through this. Okay. Um, now, one thing you've talked about before is the concept of trading fixed income for total return. And not, because I think people look at, they look at the low yield and they just say, oh, I can't make anything in bonds. So, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, again, I, we view fixed income products as tradable products, right? We don't focus on, oh, I'm going to earn 2% for the next 10 years. It's how much can we make over the next period of time? How can we trade this? Even in high yield, you know, we're out of high yield right now. and People say, oh, how can you be giving up 6% per annum? Well, you're not giving up. 6%, you're giving up a half a percent a month, it's not that big. And timing this is just as important. And I think this is interesting. If you look, you know, we talk about how great of a year equities have had, all-time highs. And sure, since January 1, the S&P 500 is up 7.7%. TLT is only up 2.2%. If you go from February 1, in spite of all these all-time highs, TLT is actually outperformed. But then these kind of, I'll call them perfect daily trading, we take a look at here is the daily change of S&P, the daily change of TLT. You take the absolute value of those. So you assume, okay, if you can catch the short days right and the long days right, how much we've made. 
TLT has actually been more volatile, and you've actually been able to capture better moves with TLT than S&P. So to the extent that you're trading looking at this, I think it's really important to you know, focus that particularly the long end of the curve. So TLT is a great one. TLH isn't bad. If you look at you know, more credit products, EM's pretty decent volatility. You've got decent amounts of volatility in HYG and JNK on the high yield side. So fixed income to me is meant to be traded. It's meant to be traded as much as anything else. Um, and I think that's where you're watching. We're not saying that this is going to be forever. We will probably be short bonds again. We've been short at times at 180 on the 10 year. Right now, here's our view. But I think people, you know, Treasuries are not meant to be buy and hold in this environment. Neither is high yield, neither is EM, neither are any of the other products we talk about. So we view it as total return rather than yield. Okay, um, let's let's take a step back and talk about the U.S. Treasury market because um, people always, I mean, people always tend to describe these kinds of markets, this and mm-hmm. currencies and things like that, are extremely large. Um, so, but I mean, I think you're making an interesting case about the supply and demand of treasuries that are actually available for sale. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is one of the charts that I think people have often found fascinating over the last little while. It looks at T-bills and just regular bonds. It does not include the tips, only because they get a little bit complicated. And, you know, for the chart, it was easier to ignore them. It doesn't change much. So the reality is there's about $10.5 trillion of T-bills and bonds outstanding. But what's really, I think, interesting is if you look at it, you know, everyone wants to talk about the long end of the curve going down. From 10 years out, there's barely a trillion dollars of bonds outstanding. And in this 10 to 15 year point, there's only 126 billion of bonds outstanding. Then what you look at, say, the Fed ownership, less than a year, the Fed owns almost no bonds. Inside of three years, almost no bonds. As soon as you start moving out to five years, the Fed starts owning 40 some odd percent of the issues. You know, again, if we look at this 10 to 15 year period, there's only 126 billion of bonds with that maturity. The Fed owns 58 billion. There's only 68 billion outstanding as a potential free float. Then you've got insurance companies in particular, often all these are not available for sale accounts. Same with pension funds. You know, people talk about what pension funds do. Generally, they are buy and hold. And if they're shifting more to equities, which I believe they've been doing, it's not that they're selling treasuries to buy equities. It just means they're buying fewer new treasuries and buying more equities as they get money in. So really, you have these tiny, tiny floats. And so, again, we want to talk about treasuries. You know, everyone talks about this treasury bear market. Oh, there's $10.5 trillion. Yes, there is. In this 10 to 15-year spot, there's only $126 billion. There's only $70 billion available. Some of that's already not available for sale because of how it's held. And don't forget, the Fed is buying $45 billion a month of treasuries. So they could take this float out so quickly. Even if you look at the longer end, greater than 20 years, it's only 800 billion. I know only seems like a uh, bizarre number with 800 billion, but it is actually a small portion. The Fed owns 300 billion of that, so over 38 percent. There's only 500 billion. Here, the proportion that's owned and not available for sale accounts is much higher. So that free float might be only 200 billion. So everyone talks about, you know, the Fed manipulating the market. Yet at the same time, there's this bubble. People have to be very well aware that the Fed can step in and buy up much more of this float and keep these yields under control. It's, you know, whether you like the policy or not, that's the reality of it. And what we have to remember is the front end is where the Fed doesn't own it, but those are controlled much more by Fed funds, which is their way to control the front end. So what the Fed has done, and they've been very, very calculated about this, you know, again, not agreeing with all of Bernanke's policies, but he is a very, very smart man. Operation Twist went out of its way to extend the maturity. That is what really created the situation where the Fed has no debt really on their balance sheet five years and in. And I think you've got to keep this in mind whenever you're looking at, oh, let's short TBT, you know, TLT or, you know, buy TBT. This float is real and it's something that has to be dealt with when you're trading this market. Okay, and uh, just so people understand, why why exactly is the Fed like choosing this distribution of maturities? Yeah, I think the Fed really realized early on in this that they will probably not be able to sell their balance sheet, that their best hope is having roll-off, and I think what they saw was 
shoot, we don't want to have debt maturing in a year and having to deal with this issue. So they created Operation Twist, which pushed everything off five years, right? So in the next three years, there's only $66 billion or $70 billion of Fed balance sheet that's coming off out of the $1.7 trillion. The Fed does not want debt coming off. They want easy policy. And I suspect if we're not doing well in two or three years, we'll see another round of Operation Twist where they re-extend. Right? So the Fed is very comfortable running a balance sheet, and they want this not to come due. Okay, um, just as a reminder to um, attendees, if you have a question, you can enter it in the Q&A section. We've already got some in, but if you have anything you'd like Peter to answer, feel free to put it in there. Um, so we're going to move on. We're going to talk about returns. So um, most I think most um, educated investors understand that the market's accepting negative real returns yeah, and I think, on you know, treasuries. And now, why is that? And it's really because the Fed controls it. So the Fed funds effective rate is 0.15%. That's where the Fed will lend to banks. So at 0.15%, the banks can borrow whatever they want. That's had an impact on three-month LIBOR, which is currently 0.27%. And it's been averaging about 0.3% over the past six months. So again, banks will lend to each other at 0.3%. They can then use that money to buy treasuries. They can use that money to buy short-dated you know, debt of companies. But that funding really drives it. You've got T-bills at 0.11%. You've got two-year treasuries at 0.24%. Again, people can fund these. They can use leverage. They can borrow overnight. And so long as they keep Fed funds low, it will keep LIBOR low. It will keep all these short-term rates, including two-year treasuries, in. At the same time, you know, the GDP PC deflator, which is what the Fed looks at, is 1.2% as of January, 1.3% in the core. CPI was, you know, 1.5% on the less volatile core, 1.9% on the core. That was as of March. You know, the Fed has already said they are comfortable with inflation running at least at 2%. And again, when they talk about inflation, they talk about the PCE. And, you know, there's indications they will let this go to 2.5%. It's unheard of in our life to kind of have a Fed so willing to live with that. I think the next chart is kind of interesting. I think this is you know, what people have to focus on. This looks at Fed funds in green versus CPI core year on year in red. And basically going back to 2000, we always had positive real returns. Fed funds were generally higher or maybe a tiny little bit lower than, um, sorry about that, than where inflation was. Yet, over the past two years, almost three years now, the Fed has lived with 1% negative real rates. And just the way it works, right? if the Fed is willing to lend overnight and short term at nothing, and it said they don't care about net real rates, this bond market can stay at very low yields for a long time. Right? So long as you have this lender of last resort willing to create this negative real returns, um, this can happen. And this has been a change in thinking that is very hard. I mean, any of us who grew up in the bond market, you were always looking at where you thought three-month LIBOR would be, where Fed funds would be, based on where you thought inflation was going to be. That was the talk, right? If inflation looked like it was ticking up, you could expect the Fed to hike rates. This Fed has decided that they're going to leave rates low and let us suffer through negative real returns. I mean, I think it's an awful thing. You know, they talk about financial repression. It is awful. But regardless of being awful, it's what they've decided to do, and they are continuing to do that. And that is a big shift in the last two to three years that people still haven't digested, I think. And it's one reason you get so many people believing bonds can sell off and not realizing that this Fed is so willing to anchor short-term rates that it's hard to get that big sell-off. Okay. Um, well, one question I always have is... Um, what could drive that Fed funds rate up? I mean, is I mean, would it be something like really strong employment for a sustained period of time, or is that just, or I mean, do you think that's just completely out of the picture that they're going to keep it low no matter what? You know, they've talked about getting to 6.5 percent unemployment, but they've already caveated that by saying, you know, if people are dropping out of the workforce, they might even go lo longer than that. So I, I think we're looking at two to three years of low rates. And personally, I don't think we're going to get this strong rebound. I do not think QE is helping the economy. I think QE is helping financial engineering, but not real engineering. I think QE is actually creating some degree of complacency where companies don't take risks. Why build a new factory when it's easier just to refi debt and boost your profits that way? Why try and enter a new market when it's just easier to, you know, again, borrow some debt and buy back your stock? So I think the Fed actually, in spite of their QE talk, 
I see very little evidence that this is impacting the real economy or that it's helping. So I don't think we're going to get this explosive growth that uh, you know too many people keep hoping for. Okay. Um, all right. We, we, we have our first question. Now it is, where are the bond vigilantes? The bond vigilantes basically used to rely on the fact that if inflation was at 2%, Fed funds would be at 2.5%. And if Fed funds were at 2.5%, then the three-year could be at 3.5%. And then the five-year could be at 4%. And then the 10-year could be at 5%. That was what you relied on. You know, The neat part is if you look at two's 10, so you look at the two-year yield versus the 10-year yield, it's about 1.2% right now is the difference. That has actually been very, very standard over the last 15 to 20 years. It doesn't deviate that much. So basically, the bond vigilantes are there. They're saying, hey, two years to 10 years is 1.2% differential like normal. What's happening is the front end doesn't move because if the Fed doesn't raise rates, treasuries will remain low. There's nothing to stop, you know, so long as banks can borrow at 0.15% or they can repo it easily, the one-year treasury is going to be bent somewhere around Fed funds. And I think that's the sad truth of it, that the bond vigilantes, there's nothing they can really do if the Fed keeps rates so low. As you move out the curve, it can happen a little bit more. You can see the long bond, which is far less under the Fed's control, move higher. But again, it's kind of this bootstrapping methodology that just says that it can't get too high. And forward curves are already high, and the spread, twos, tens, of 1.2% is fairly normal. Um, so it's not like the bond vigilantes have gone away. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, why don't we move on to the forward curve? Okay. You know, again, this is probably a little bit technical, but again, it's one of these things that it really keeps coming back to how the Fed can anchor rates, probably all the way up to five years for sure, and maybe as far as ten years by controlling Fed funds. And, you know, rates are actually, these forward rates are reasonably steep already. They're building in some price hikes. So right now the one year is yielding 0.12%. The two year is earning 0.23%. So basically if you buy the, you could, in bond ways, you could do one of two things. You could buy the two year right now and earn 0.23% for two years. Or you could buy the one year and expect to roll it in a year. The fair value for you to do that is 0.34% in the second year, because really what you would expect to make is over two years, 0.46%, which is the um, you know the two-year rate. So if you only made 0.12% in the first year, you have to make 0.11 plus the 0.23 in your second year to be break even, so that's 0.34. So you're already seeing in one year, the one-year bond should be at 0.34%. That's one rate hike. So the market isn't asleep at the switch. The market is already pricing this in. So again, I think sitting there and saying the bond market's insane, it's not. It's actually pricing in a reasonably, you know, it would be pricing in a tripling of the one-year rate a year from now. It's not asleep at the switch. The vigilantes are there. It just doesn't look normal because the base is so low. Okay, all right. Um, why don't we move on? We, we talked about the effect of rates. Now, um, now this table basically explains um, what would happen to the actual price of treasuries if yields went up, and worst yeah, and case I, scenario looks ugly, but not disastrous. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the one thing is, let's just say, and it's not at 2% today, but you know, if we take a look at the 10-year at 2%, if it jumped to 5% today, that's a 3% move, you're at 77 points. Now you would say, hey, it's a 10-year bond, it moved 3%, shouldn't we be down 30 points? And no, and that's the first thing that is, you've got this convexity and pull to par effect. So that as yields move lower, you don't get as much price appreciation or differential. So you can see the difference between a 2% move and a 3% move is about 8.5 points. The 3 to 4% is slightly less. And by the time you're moving from 4 to 5%, it's not even a 7-point move. So this convexity actually helps bond buyers. But then let's think about this. Okay, so. Clearly now, if we move from 2% to 5% overnight, you would have had this 10-year move, and you would have lost 23 points. So we certainly would be in this bubble category. But now let's think a little bit longer. Let's say that you've actually held this for a year. So the first step is now you get your two points. And even this huge move in the course of a year would, in theory, take you down to, oh, sorry, this isn't without interest. In a year, just because you get the full to par effect, 
a nine-year bond yielding 5% is at 79 cents on the dollar. Then you've earned two points of interest, and so now you're at 81 cents on the dollar. And then the reality actually is, because you have this curve, if the 10-year is yielding 5%, the nine-year would probably be at 4.8%. So you know what? You've lost 18 points. Your total return would have been down 18 points in what I think is actually an insanely large move, given everything else that's going on. Yeah, okay, um, well, well, let's um, take back one, for one yeah. little thing. Now, what could get yields up to 5%, though? I mean, could it be, you know, a huge collapse in confidence in, in the U.S. economy? I assume if, if people woke up one day and their bonds were worth, government bonds were down 23%, I mean, not assuming it would happen in one day, but I think if people lost a lot of money in bonds, um, you know, wouldn't they be like converging on Washington with pitchforks and um, right? And you're assuming now that Bernanke just doesn't buy up every single Treasury to keep it down, right? I, again, right? This, this is a manipulated market where the Fed can buy as much as they want. They could buy all the ten years. What happened if there was not a single ten-year bond available for the public? I have no idea. <laughs> Neither do I, but I think it's a very likely course of action and far more likely that the Fed does that before allowing it to go to 5%. Okay, um, well then I think a lot of people, the related question I think a lot of people have is, does the Fed and other central banks for that matter, do they have unlimited firepower? You know, they seem to at this stage. If, and what I think will happen, right, is it will hit us somewhere else. One thing that can happen is I think corporate bonds or high yield bonds, high yield bonds could be a disaster, and you could see spreads hit all time highs because talking about spreads when the treasury rate's not a real rate, there's no reason to hold credit risk at that point. Will it impact FX? Will it be a disaster in other ways? I think we are going to see this policy lead to some sort of problem where. Again, Bernanke himself has often said one of the problems with the Great Depression was that everyone became very focused on their own countries, trade barriers went up. Well, guess what? All this QE is, I think, effectively another form of trade barriers. It's causing these currency wars, right? China's mad at us. We're mad at Japan. You know, emerging markets are mad at everyone. Europe's mad at us. Italy looks longingly at the ECB wanting to do QE. I, I, I completely believe that they are going down a path that's causing problems. I don't think it's going to show up, certainly not first, in treasury prices. It's going to be other corporate bond assets, so I think it shows up in high yield. I think it will show up in FX. I think it will show up in equities. I think you will see, again, it, if people are losing that much confidence, equities are not going up. Okay. I don't right, see um, a scenario where you get this big treasury sell-off and equities are fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, that brings us to our next slide about the ten-year treasury. Um, and you know, you talk here about how the um, you know mortgages are based off the ten-year, but equities are also valued off the ten-year. Almost every you know discounted cash flow model, the um, the ten-year is in there as an input on probably every model there is. Right. So I, you know, people seem to want to talk about this great rotation where okay, hey, this is great. Yields would go up and stocks would go up. That may work for a small period of time, but if we really start seeing treasury rates spike up, one, they become attractive to investors again. Two, as you say, all the discount cash flows are bad. And if this is happening for any reason that some sort of lack of confidence in the U.S. or in us as a currency, I don't see that helping stocks that well. I think we will see real problems in the economy. Um, so, yeah, I, this belief somehow that we can spike in rates and equities will be fine. I don't understand that. I think these things are too linked. And again, I think the Fed sees that, right? This Fed wants our mortgage market to do well. Law, mortgages price off the tenure. The Fed is going to try and defend that. They realize people are pricing stocks off of that. I, I just see too many incentives for this Fed to go out of their way to support the market. And again, they can control the front end by keeping Fed funds low. They can control the long end by buying bonds. And so long as they do that, where inflation is, it'll be hard to deal with. Corporates, they can't do that with, right? Corporates, people will sell, and I think you will see a sell-off much quicker, particularly in the high-yield space, than maybe people realize. And the talk that spreads are attractive right now, I, I find that less comforting, because you can't really spread yourself to an artificial rate. And I think I'm not overly concerned about high-yield right now, but I think that's where you will see the big first move, is really people get concerned about geez, why am I lending money to this horrible company? But if that happens, again, how do equities sustain that? 
and I don't see that happening. Okay, um, so let's talk about high yield for a second. Uh, we talked offline before about um, there's all these pension funds and endowments underperforming, and they can't really go, because of their mandates, they can't really go whole hog into equities. And if they're going to put new money to work at low yields, I mean, are th are those types of places going to crowd into high yield just to squeeze out squeeze out a little extra turn? Because you see, like Calpers, they they have like multi billion dollar deficits every year between the growth of their assets and liabilities. Yeah, I think you know they're across the board. People are moving into riskier and riskier assets. I think you know what the Fed has done is you really only have three choices. You can either go into longer maturities, you can go down the credit curve or you can move into less liquid assets. And I think we're seeing that at insurance companies, we're seeing that at pension funds, we're seeing it at banks, right? The banks are starting to build up big loan books again. They're moving back to non-market-to-market -market accounting, back to accrual accounting. They just want to build up big books. You're seeing you know, this huge flood of space in this, the BDCs, or the Business Development Corps, where I think the one interesting aspect was middle market lending basically disappeared during the crisis. Banks weren't encouraged to do it. There was no CLO market. All of a sudden, that's become, you know, private equity and pension funds are coming there. Okay. Um, I, I want to seize it on one phrase you said, less liquid assets, because, I mean, in the past, we've seen a lot of people, particularly individual investors, getting burned on these sort of structured products with high yields, and then part of it's their fault because they didn't read the prospectus. They didn't know it was linked to Argentinian inflation or whatever. So, I mean, what advice do you have for people that are kind of being tempted by these, you know, sophisticated sounding sort of structured instruments that their brokers probably want to sell them? You know, I think you are far better off looking at some of these either the basic ETFs or simple bonds. You know, we've looked at these structures. I mean, that's, we used to make a living selling these when I was at Bankers Trust and it's, you know, range of cruel notes. First, all the optionalities in the fa favor of the dealer. And they clearly know, oh, if I slap a 4% coupon it for a year, people will buy this. And they are left with horrible, horrible investments that will not work as they think they should. So I, I really believe that if you're looking at these funky structured products, the first decision is to run. And then the second decision is to how fast do you run away from that. And really see what's out there in terms of more simple, basic products and yes, you know what? It, it is a low yield environment. It is hard to get yield. But moving into something that seems too good to be true is probably not. And again, all this bond math allows people to create phenomenal looking structures that particularly pay a high coupon in the early years and awful in the long run. I think things like these business development corps that are coming up, that can be interesting. But again, you really need to look at the manager and the fees and what it's being charged there, how much leverage. Same with the closed end funds. You know, I think people look at it it's like, ooh, this has an 8% return. But, you know, hey, the people who created that closed end fund also know that you're looking for high returns. So they have cobbled together whatever portfolio gets that so they can get their assets under management. I think you have to be very careful. I think closed end funds are okay. I think these certificates of deposit that the brokers are being asked to fix, you know, they're barely intelligible to me. And, you know, we've created in the past. You have to build up the spreadsheet and you realize the dealer is making far more money and there's probably a better way for you to take that risk and earn better returns if you really want to take that sort of risk. Okay, um, so we have, we have a good question here. So um, are you suggesting that there's kind of the um, foundation for a bubble in junk bonds? And yeah. could that spill over to equities if, if there is a problem down the road? Yeah, I think there's definitely is, right? These companies have been growing. They've been getting cheap access to capital. And res again, I'm this I don't know, whether it's going to be a bubble that appears today or whether it's going to last a year or whether it's two years. But you're seeing all those sort of telltale signs where covenants are being waived. So, you know, you're allowing companies to get more leverage. You are demanding less collateral. You know, the leverage loans are doing what they call these cov light deals or lower levels of security. They're taking lower loan to value. So basically in this search for yield, investors are giving up the protections. And, you know, when you look at kind of the risky end of bond lending, one, the coupon is very good for you. That obviously helps, and the higher the coupon, the better. That's been getting pushed away. But you can always protect yourself by you know, strong covenants, reducing what the company could do. You know, if you're on the loan side, you actually had access to inf non-public information, and you could control what the company does. Those are starting to be waived. And again, I think we're being set up where too many people own the wrong stuff. And you know, I think what we saw happen in gold this past few days 
I get very concerned that we can see a similar scenario play out in the high yield market where what you have is this one large, you know, two, in this case, two large ETFs that are a big portion of the flows. You have lots of investors who are in it but haven't really understood just how illiquid these bonds are. And, you know, this was a market where, you know, in the old days, how are you making them? 99 par. Someone tries to sell you bonds at 99. Ooh, you know, I don't really want to buy them. Where can you buy them? 98 and a half. Uh, okay. You buy them later in the day. Someone asks, where are you now? 98.9. Okay. I sell you some at 98. Now, where can I sell you some? Uh, nowhere really. Uh, what do you mean nowhere? Well, you know, I bought some earlier. I'm trying to work, but if I find a buyer, I'll get you in. That's how the market used to work. These ETFs, I think, will create this flow. They will allow electronic trading. They will allow the ARBs to come in. And I think you could see a little bit of a death spiral. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not saying we're going to get anything like 2008, but I think something that might be a routine 1% to 3% move could easily become a 3 to 5% move. And I think that's some of what we saw in GLD and gold, where you had some real selling, but then you had this exodus out of the ETF at the same time. And I think that's a real risk to those markets. And I look at high yield as being susceptible, the leveraged loan market, and I think even the EM market, which is right now why kind of we're very neutral on those markets. We think there's a high risk that we're seeing something happen. Again, what I look at is, if you, again, whether people are getting too ch chasing it. If you're a hedge fund right now in the credit space and you want to make 10% after fees and high yield only earns 5%, you basically have to run two to three times levered 5% bonds to get that fees. No one in this world, as much as they say it, has the comfort level. If those bonds drop two points, you're two times levered, that's a 4% loss. Those funds aren't buying more. They're selling because they need to raise money because they don't want to show a horrible negative return. So, yeah, I think we're susceptible to a move that could be a 2007 sort of precursor again where this leverage, all these new products interact, and everyone thinks there's more liquidity than there really is. Okay, um, so we're we're getting a ton of questions in uh, as usual. Um, you know, we love our audience, but they always wait for the very end and then they pile in. Okay, so um, we'll try to get through these quickly so we can get in as many as possible. So, Peter, do you think the 10-year will take out the 2012 lows at 1.4 percent? And if so, what would it take to get there? You know, I think much worse economic data. For us, our target right now has been 1.6, and it had been 1.8. Um, 1.4, maybe. I, again, I, I think we're in an okay economy. So I think, you know, jobs will bounce around. So I, certainly by 1.6, I think we'd be out of our treasury position right now and probably leaning towards short unless something has changed where economic growth is much worse. Um, but, you know, so I would say no. Um, and certainly even here, two weeks ago we were more comfortable calling 180 or 1.8% our tight end of our range. And what I can do tomorrow, we'll make sure we send you the chart where we've looked at it and kind of where we've come up with the 1.6 for now. Okay. Um, and from uh, Minion Eric, we are, we are listening to you. So, Peter, could you talk a little bit about Japan and, um, you know, their, their printing press activities and what effect those could have on the bond market and if there's any – you know, anything buys or sells off of that. You know, one thing I think myself and everyone kind of I know, if you haven't lost money being short JGBs at some point, you just haven't tried hard because it seemed like it's an intelligent trade at any number of times over the past 20 years. You know, they have worse debt to GDP statistics than Greece. You know, all sorts of problems, and yet they just hit a record low. And they hit that record low even after they made their announcement. So the things I don't like there, it's become very, very volatile. And whenever volatility increases in credit, that to me is a very strong sign that you will see a sell-off because risk managers start cutting down this. And credit's always this bizarre thing. If you're running a $100 million portfolio, in the good times you're thinking, okay, 3%, okay, I'm making $3 million. If I can get 3.1%, I'm making $3.1 million. And all of a sudden your psychology changes to like, wow, if this goes bad, I could lose $100 million. And in Japan, we seem to be almost catching that sort of moment. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that JGBs have always surprised everyone, I think we could see rates back up there. Um, but again, it's, what strikes me is we're all nervous to call JGBs as a bubble, and yet it's been in this thing for 20 years, yet so many people are happy to call treasuries a bubble, and we've only been in it a couple of years. So, um, I, I, and again, for me, it's been that selling pressure in JGBs where I think people are now so concerned about yen 
that the dollar assets look attractive. And this isn't a carry trade. People are talking about the carry trade. It's not a carry trade because that's been around forever. What changed is this yen devaluation trade, and it was really that selling in the yen or in the Japanese bonds that led us to change our view that we could go from 180 to 160. And maybe that's what could also happen is you get this further pressure and we go to 140 because people want out of yen denominated assets and somehow they actually view the dollar as a safe haven again. Okay, um, you know, we're getting a few questions on floating rate notes. So um, uh, one reader brought up there said there's heavy issuance of floating rate notes this year. And what do you think about those bonds or those funds? I know there's a couple of ETFs out there. You know, I, I've looked at FLOT, for example, which has a lot of uh, bank floaters. Not horribly excited because, again, I think, one, let's even say the 10-year moves from 2% to 2.5% or say 170 out to 2.5%. The short end, LIBOR could stay the same because that's anchored by the Fed, so you won't get a pickup. So moving into floaters, you can avoid losses on the yield, but you're not actually going to get a benefit. The leverage loans, which we've generally liked, but we've kind of pulled out recently, they have their floating rate notes, but where you have to be careful there, a lot of them have LIBOR floors. So they pay 1% LIBOR or 1% plus a spread, whichever is greater. So a lot of them would need multiple rate hikes, again, before going into... Um, before actually paying more than they currently are. So we generally like leverage loans. I'm not afraid of these floating rate funds, but I think if you have a bearish view on treasuries um, or rates, there's probably better ways to play it. Um, but yeah, I, I think these are fine. I get a bit nervous in anything that's smaller than, you know, a billion dollars in terms of the potential liquidity, but it does seem like FLOT has been growing. Um, and again, it, it's not bad. It's paying more than a and I prefer them probably to money markets and you know what you're getting. I just don't see this Fed raising rates, and if the Fed doesn't raise rates, LIBOR is not going to go up, so you're going to be earning a fairly low coupon. I still think you're better off managing a small allocation to high yield, probably a small allocation to leverage loans, trading treasuries around, and avoiding those products for now until you start re seeing real signs the Fed will raise rates. Okay. Um, how about munis? What do you think about munis? I mean, we, there have been calls. You know, we saw Stockton go bankrupt. Um, some trouble in Philadelphia, Detroit. Uh, what do you? Think, what's your outlook for munis? You know, we're a little bit torn on munis. I think the one thing, as a whole, we're fairly comfortable with Treasury rates and with munis yielding more than Treasuries, whereas traditionally they hadn't. That gives us some degree of comfort. On the other hand, and this, we're definitely. Muni seemed like an obvious target for tax policy. You know, they're owned largely by the rich, so you could see that happening. You know, we're getting a few, well, we're getting some places that are doing worse. I think as a whole, municipalities have been getting their books in order, so I'm not overly concerned about it from a credit perspective. I do think, from a liquidity standpoint, I would want to be out of munis a little bit or have a reduced exposure. So I think the best is to say we don't mind them, but I would want to start paring down risk because the worst case scenario isn't going to be defaults. It's going to be that all of a sudden Congress gets it in their mind that they can, you know, hurt owners of municipal bonds by reducing the tax deduction. Then you're going to be trying to sell an illiquid asset for the same reason everyone else is. So I would be pairing out of munis. We kind of like them okay, but not in love with them. Either. Okay. So, yeah. um, Sorry for being wishy-washy. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's fine. It's as long as it's the truth. Okay. Now, I, another interesting question. I asked you this before, and I feel like everybody's asking. And I think it says something about the human condition with the economy and uh, you know post-housing bubble. But um, everybody's worried about the wheels coming off and the Fed losing control. Like, and it, it sounds like you have confidence in them, at least from a financial market perspective. Maybe you don't like the policies. But from a market's perspective, it seems like you have confidence, but like, what would keep you up at night? What, what do you think could make the Fed lose control? And lose control in terms of rates going a lot higher? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, basically propping up financial markets. You know, I, I think it ultimately comes down. I think we're starting on that path where it's this currency wars where really each country starts retaliating at each other whether it's through QE and then it leads to something else, you know, China starts saying, okay, we're going to impose a tariff or we're going to do something. So I think that is my big fear is that someone, and, you know, China seems the most likely candidate says, you know what, this is ridiculous. You guys have an economy that's doing semi-okay. Why are you still printing money? And starts trying to retaliate, tries to create their own currency, tries to do something else. So, I, you know, again, I, I do not discount that there is a chance that we could see 
rates spike higher, and I think that will only come if we really lose reserve currency status. And I think the more games we play, the more we keep QE when people see our economy is doing okay, I think the greater that risk is. Um, you know, I would much rather see us pull back on buying. Okay, um, n another question. Do you think um, political rhetoric will heat up around currency wars? Yeah, I think it's already starting. I mean, I can't believe that the Treasury Department complained about Japan's uh, actions. I mean, that seemed ridiculous given what we've been doing. Well, uh, wait, 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 let me interrupt you for one second. Um, isn't it kind of tradition for um, American presidents to, like, be for a strong dollar? It's like, it's the right thing to say? Right, it's the right thing to say, and you know, no one really means it. I think you know, Japan's going to be interesting. Japan strikes me too as where we might see real problems because I, I do not believe in this whole devaluation as being a great strategy. And the only place that devaluation strikes me as it's worked has been emerging markets, and there it only works because as they start devaluing, they have lots of natural resources, and they nationalize those natural resources. So I don't see this being a big success in Japan, and maybe that's what triggers people to lose faith in this. Um, but again, if we start losing faith in QE, I think the stock market goes first, and treasuries actually retain that bid for a period of time. Okay, um, uh, you know, you brought up gold before. Now, um, gold just got cracked pretty hard. It's it's in bear market territory. Um, you know, if you look back to 2008 and 2009, gold skyrocketed as a safety trade. Um, do you think in the future the safety trades, um, you know, will be, are treasuries that now? Because I, I feel like a lot of confidence has been shaken in gold. Do you think people will be looking not so much the conspiracy theorists, but um, but just regular people looking for a safety play? Do you think treasuries are it for them rather than gold? Uh, you know, I think. Certainly at the institutional level, this past two days move has changed their view towards gold. That I can tell you because the risk management all got hauled in and is all having to explain how some five or six or seven standard deviation event occurred on their watch. So I can right now, institutionally, everyone is having their limits or ability to take gold risk reduced. On top of that, it's even worse because gold had actually been negatively correlated with stocks and became positively correlated in the wrong direction. So a lot of people who are long stocks and long gold as a hedge, it's been an atrocious few days because not only have they moved more than they expected, they moved in the same direction. So I think institutionally we're going to see gold far, far less of a safe haven trade. And that will probably, it's, if that's going on institutional level, it's probably going on at the retail level. So yeah, I, I think this idea of gold as a safe haven has probably been a little bit beat up on. And I, I only follow gold periphery. I kind of understand why people hate it and why people like it. Um, but I do think the reality is this move was so big and so surprising, it will leave a scar on that market. That's another reason we've actually turned bearish, because I think you know, if you're the risk manager, say, I don't know, some large hedge fund, you have had to explain how you lost more money than possible on gold. And as you're dealing with that situation, everyone's probably saying, well, what about this market? What about that market? So I think you're going to see reduced position size, you know, across the board, um, which is probably why we see equity sell off. It's probably why we might not see, you know, treasuries rally as much. And again, if I want to be short treasuries these days, when I do look at it, I like to be short at the long end because the Fed can control that far less. When I like to be long, I tend to like to play it through the 10-year or this TLH because I think that's where there's a lot more control both via the front end and their purchases and the small float. Okay, um, well, let's shift a little bit over to market structure. Uh, one thing I think was really interesting is, um, you know, some people don't know this, but PIMCO recently released a, an ETF version of the total return fund, which um, is the biggest mutual fund in the world, bonds or equity run by Bill Gross. It's they're up to about $300 billion. Now they have an ETF under the ticker bonds, and it's actually drawing in more money even though it's on a much smaller base, it's drawing in volume-wise, not percentage-wise, volume-wise, it's drawing in more money than the bigger mutual fund. Now, I mean, because of the low fees and the efficiency, do you think ETFs are going to basically push mutual funds to the side in fixed income? No, because I think what's happening is people like me, we can pull up the ETF holdings and determine what PIMCO is buying or selling with a couple-day lag. 
And in their mutual funds, they could hide pretty well what they were doing, right? Because you only disclose it once in a while. And yeah, you know, they'd be buying treasuries from three dealers, but they'd be selling it to two other dealers. They'd be trying to disguise what they're doing. I think they're actually a little bit afraid by the openness of this. And I think, you know, I'll be cynical here, but you'll notice they haven't been in high yield much. And the reality is they can't be in high yield because now it was already hard when they had to buy $10 billion of high yield to move the needle but you couldn't tell what they were doing. Now when it's so obvious because it shows up in this ETF, I think there's going to be a pullback. That's why a lot of other managers have not rushed to launch actively managed fixed income ETFs. And there's been a pushback. I can't remember who it is. Someone's now trying to get permission not to publish ETF holdings frequently. And that to me, I think that's a disaster if the SEC lets that happen. To me, mutual funds should remain longer term strategies where the manager doesn't have to give daily disclosure. ETFs, if you're trying to trade it, how can you trade it without at least, you know, portfolios that were right to within a day or two? So I think that's been the big problem. I think the success of that one, people were at first excited, but as I talked to, you know, big money managers, they don't like the idea of having to disclose their position so timely, and it works well for the, you know, the HYGs or JNKs, which are really index-based or at least loosely index-based. I think people don't want to give away what they're doing, and even PIMCO, I think, has some regrets because it's given too much information and it's hurt their ability to manage their portfolio as they'd like. Okay, um, but I mean, do you think some a firm like PIMCO that is so big? that wouldn't they kind of leave train tracks all over the market anyway, like by virtue of size? Yeah, they do. But again, it's, you know, there's 10 dealers you can call. You try and, you know, sell some bonds to one guy. You're buying some. You've got some guy who's trying to work on your behalf to buy them. They, I mean, their traders are paid to try and obfuscate what they're doing. Um, and, you know, they will go out and out lie to two people saying they're buying. So those guys will spread the rumor that PIMCO's buying. Meanwhile, PIMCO's selling hand over fist through someone else. So, you don't really know what they're doing. You can guess what they're doing. You can try. They're out there trying to trick you into believing they're doing something else for execution. Um, and yeah, that's become a problem, I think, for PIMCO as they got so big. Even outside of their ETF, it became very hard to hide what they were doing in a high yield space or some of the smaller spaces. Um, treasuries, it's still relatively easy. Okay, folks, I think we are going to wrap it up. And um, I just want to thank Peter for giving us his expertise. Um, and, um, you know, as you may know, we recently launched Peter Shear's Fixed Income Report, which gives his um, portfolio allocations, his, you know, mind-boggling depth of knowledge on the bond market. Um, I feel like I could go for 12 hours with questions, and, you know, he just knows that he seems to know every little thing, and he's and he's very much plugged in. So um, you can email us, and we will cut you a deal, and let us know if you're a Buzz subscriber or anything else, and we will definitely hook you up. Um, and Peter, I don't think there's much else to say. Do you have anything you'd um, like people to know? No, thanks very much. And again, you know, feel free to reach out to us um, here or Twitter, and you know, hopefully you know, get everyone up to speed on fixed income. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Peter.